because that's the last speech. So I'm just <laughs> it's not be all right over here. Camera, camera, hey! Hello out there in Streamland. Hello everyone here at SimFest. You'll notice this mic is not amplifying my voice to you. It is in fact just sending me out on the live stream. So many of you will want to come forward through the day. We've got great speakers and you will want to hear what they say. Don't feel afraid if you're not hearing them during the session to come up to the front and uh, check out what they're saying. Uh, glad to be back. We've been doing this since 2016. The Georgia Game Developers Association is a nonprofit association representing everyone who makes video games in Georgia. We're about 600 members around the state and very glad to have a Columbus, uh, middle uh, Georgia chapter. A uh, lot of great topics today, mainly focusing on design, but also the coding sign and especially how to get into the industry. And very happy that we're going to start today off with our, our good friend from Exuline, Anatoly, who made my daughter's all-time favorite game. Uh, not, not Galactic Space Baby Adopter, but... Uh, about for Galaxy. Galaxy, there we go. And uh, so, has more downloads probably than any other indie developer in Georgia. So, uh, uh, doesn't have the 300 million players of, uh, of Smite, but... Uh, a pretty good number, but I'll let him introduce himself and tell you more about it. Stay tuned through the day. We're going to keep the stream running uh, until lunch. We'll take a break at lunch and come back for the keynote with Joe Kasava doing his... Or are you at 11? I'm at 11. Uh, 11, all right. So we'll after, after the keynote, we'll take a break. But we're going to go ahead and start up with Anatoly. If you can't hear us during the stream, please let us know in the chat. And I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker of the day, Anatoly. Thank you, Andrew. Hey. Good morning. My name is Anatoly Lubarsky, and I'm the founder and lead developer at text to line an indie game development studio. I have 23 years of developer experience, and since 2010, I am an independent game developer. And I'd like to thank the organizers of SimFest for the opportunity to speak today. x line is best known for our Baby Adopter franchise, a series of role-playing games uh, where players take care of a virtual child. We also have other role-playing games and puzzle games, including those in Match 3 and Mahjong genres. Our Baby Adopter franchise includes five games where players babysit a virtual child. They feed, take care of, dress up the child, and players can also decorate various game locations and play mini-games. Our primary title, Baby Adopter, has over 3 million downloads on both Apple Store and Google Play Store each. Additionally, it has ac accumulated over 15 million installs on Facebook Canvas in its HTML5 version. And there are around 20-30 million installs on other social networks. Most of them don't exist anymore. Here's our primary title called Baby Adopter on Google Play. It has more than 3 million downloads on Apple and Google Play each. As you can see on Google Play, it's, it says 1M plus, 1 million plus. 1 million plus indicates that the game has between 1 and 5 million downloads. The progression on Google Play is 1, 5, 10, 50 and so on. Specifically, if you see a game with 10 M plus downloads, it means the game has anywhere from 10 to 49 million downloads. Here's uh, another game uh, on Google Play from x line also, which has above 1 million downloads. It's called Little Girl Magic, where the players take care of a seven-year-old girl. Today, I am here to share insights on making games more accessible for players with vision loss based on my experience in the field. The goal of accessibility in gaming is to remove barriers preventing people from fully enjoying video games. We aim to create an environment where everyone can participate. This effort doesn't only assist player, players with disabilities, it also enriches the game experience for all by providing more ways to play. Accessibility involves designing 
creating content and choosing features that make our games more accessible to a wider audience. It's not worthy that features designed for accessibility benefit not just individuals with disabilities, but are also widely used by others when available. With voiceover features on iPhone and talkback feature on Android devices, blind users can do nearly everything, from sending messages to taking selfies and sharing them on social media. The introduction of voiceover in iPhone 3 significantly changed the lives of people with vision loss. Now developers have the ability to use these accessibility features through APIs. However, it's important to point out that only a few pop popular games are fully optimized for people who use voice voiceover, making such games highly valued by blind or visually impaired players. Generally, these players are more loyal and engaging than, usually, than usual, showing significantly higher retention rates and overall engagement than average. In this talk, I'll discuss both players with color blindness. <coughs> color blindness is when uh, a person does either doesn't see certain colors or he mixes certain shades, but other than that, uh, his vision is okay. He sees everything. Uh, but I will cover color, bl color blindness but the main focus of the talk, though, will be on adjusting game me mechanics for players with significant vision loss and blind players. These adjustments can also benefit players, all players, not just people with uh, vision loss or deficiencies. And overall, it may improve your game. Some tips may be more challenging to implement and not all will fit every game but many are straightforward and easy to incorporate. Here are some statistics about 12 million Americans are colorblind and worldwide one in 12 men and one in 200 women are colorblind. That works out to 360 million people worldwide who are colorblind. Approximately 6 million Americans have significant vision loss and 1 million are blind. S relatively, it doesn't seem a big number, but uh, objectively 1 million people who are blind, it, it's a big number. It's like the size of a big city in the United States. Uh, let's summarize the five key tips for designing with visually impaired players in mind. In tip number one, I'll cover the designing for color blindness. Tip number two, three, four, five, I will, are related to people with significant vision loss and blind people. Number two will cover external and in-game controls for games played on PC and mobile. Number three will cover simplifying screen exploration. Number four will cover simplifying navigation. And number, number five will cover implementing adaptive difficulty. The most important tips from this list are exploring the screen, is number three, and simplifying navigation. I will start with color blindness. People with color blindness have difficulty seeing certain colors. To make designs accessible for them, here are some best practices. Y use patterns, shapes, or other visual cues alongside color coding. This helps not just those with color blindness, but also makes it easier for everyone else by providing multiple cues. It's also beneficial for individuals with low vision or cognitive disorders. So if you have like similar items on the screen and uh, they are only different by color, consider adding patterns or shape or, or using different shapes. 
also en enhance the size and contrast of colors and include a legend for color dependent tasks. When it involves color identification, stick to commonly recognized shades. Errors increase significantly with the use of less common shades like neon green paired with dark yellow or forest green with bright yellow. It's helpful to check your designs with color vision deficiency CVD simulators. More, moreover, it's crucial to consider the needs of colorblind people at the start of design process. This approach avoids the need for later changes due to accessibility issues that uh, pop out. CVD simulators uh, are usually available online. You can Google uh, CV, so col color vision deficiency simulator and uh, it will apply filter for different types of color blindness. Here, for example, screenshots from, a ga from my game called Planet Formula viewed from the left side it's original and on the right side it's as it viewed through a color blindness filter. It's a match three game. Uh, while on the right side you see while some colors may not be visible, the game remains playable thanks to different patterns added to the colors. That being said, I acknowledge that I could do a better job to enhance the contrast of the planets and improve the patterns to make the game even more accessible. Because you can see that uh, red uh, mixes with brown and so on. Here's another match three game called Egg Formula, also viewed through a color blindness filter. On the left side, it's original colors, and on the right side is um, through uh, a filter, how colorblind person can, can see it. Uh, this also, thanks to different, different patterns, not only colors, it's totally playable by colorblind. Uh, here's another game, it's called Clue Formula, also viewed through color blindness filter. Uh, here, I instead of patterns, uh, all tiles, they have different shapes. And uh, also from the start of the development, the colors were picked up with, with color blindness in mind. And uh, tiles are distinguishable by most players with different color blind deficiencies. How can we know that the game is playable by a color blind, blind player? We can use tools already available, like for example, there are Chrome Dev, tool, Dev Tools, Photoshop filters, and like I said, uh, like I mentioned, online CVD simulators. CVD, CVD simulators allow us to simulate how our games are perceived by those with color vision deficiencies, ensuring our designs are accessible to all. Here, for example, Google Chrome, you can see, you can uh, open developer tools pressing F12, then choose accessibility, and then rendering, and then choose from the drop-down different types of color blind uh, and, uh, Chrome, and Google Chrome will show the website <coughs> uh, viewed through this filter. It will change colors and uh, you will see your design, if it's like web, how colorblind person sees it. There are also colorblind filters available in uh, Photoshop. For example, if you can go to um, view proof setup and there are a few color blind filters available. Here for example uh, a screenshot illustration from a game in Photoshop and here after I applied a, fi a filter or a color blind filter already available in Photoshop and how we can see the design. So you can, uh, if you're designing, you can uh, always check your design with colorblind uh, player in mind. 
there are also many resources related to color blindness available for developers online. For example, there is a web AIM website which provides many resources and tools and simulators for developers. You can go to webaim.org and there are many resources, tools um, and simulators. Starting from tip number two, I'll concentrate on players who are visually impaired or blind. It's called, tip number two, it's called external controls. For PC games, it's important to map controls to keyboard keys, not just the mouse. For example, if your game is only playable with mouse, consider adding that it will be playable with keyboard keys. This is because visually impaired people often use accessibility devices connected to their computer, and these devices are mapped to the keyboard. Plus, generally speaking, it's harder for these individuals to play games only using a mouse. Here, for example, we can see external accessibility device used by blind people or people with the vision loss. Considering players with vision loss, mobile games should be designed for one hand play. If your game currently requires two hands, you might want to think about redesigning it for one handed use. This is because blind players often find it difficult to coordinate both hands while also scanning the screen. Making your game one hand friendly isn't just good for those with vision loss. It also helps people with other disabilities. It helps children who may, who may only be able to use one hand to hold the device while playing and uh, with the second hand they play. It can help newcomers to gaming. Simplifying to one-handed play can lessen both cognitive and physical demands on all players. Everyone benefits from one-handed gameplay because it enhances mob mobility and flexibility. It makes gaming possible in a variety of situations where using both hands might not be feasible. Like on crowded public transport or when one hand is needed for assistive devices. By focusing on one-handed play for mobile games, developers are encouraged to innovate in game design and the user interface. This leads to creative solutions, not only it doesn't only make games more accessible to people with disabilities, but also improve the overall experience for, uh, for a broader audience. Now, about in-game controls. The controls that developer is uh, responsible to. Offering separate controls for music and sound effects lets players tailor their audio experience. Many blind players like to turn off the music but keep the sound effects on. Therefore, it's important to provide individual controls for this in the settings rather than having a single control for all audio. This for example uh, we can see a fake screenshot where music and audio effect settings are two separate controls instead of making just one control for all audio. For games with text developers should think about offering customization options for in-game text. This includes adjusting the font size, contrast, and color settings for text. Doing so benefits not just players with low vision, but also makes reading easier for everyone. Here another screenshot where we can see uh, different configurations for text. Also think about Adding voice commands is another way to navigate menus and make selections. Any alerts, messages, or significant in-game events and changes should be narrated to the player. Because uh, 
blind people or people with vision loss, they simply don't see uh, changes that we are that normal players can easily see on the screen. Also, include descriptive audio for games environments, character movements, and objects. Also, using stereo can help players figure out where they are in the game world, making it easier to navigate and identify important elements just by sound. This approach isn't only helpful for visually impaired players, it benefits everyone. Also consider incorporating haptic feedback to confirm interactions or warn players of nearby objects or threats. This kind of tactile feedback is especially valuable for visually impaired players, offering direct and intuitive cues that enhance, enhance immersion and reaction in the game. This tip too, like all previous tips, is not just uh, benefits visually impaired players, it benefits everyone. Now it's uh, maybe the most important tip, number three, exploring the screen. How do visually impaired players explore the screen? On mobile devices, users of voiceover, voiceover is a feature, for example, on iPhone, that uh, narrates this, what the person has on the screen, it narrates it to the user. On mobile devices, users of voiceover don't have to touch, hold, and tap randomly to find objects and spaces. Instead, players who are visually impaired or blind explore by dragging and swiping their finger across the screen without lifting it until they discover something. So they use continuous swiping, and this is how they scan and explore the screen. Using continuous swipe gestures, either left to right or top to bottom, allows them to easily and quickly move from one item to the next in the order they appear on, this, appear on the screen. As a result, objects on the screen need to be made focusable and highlightable. This way, players can move from one focusable object to the next simply by swiping right and left. For mobile games, this means making objects selectable and highlightable and enabling a continuous swiping gesture to select the next item. This functionality is typically accessible through the API on both Apple and Android devices. From the perspective of a voiceover player, the key feature that determines if a game is playable for visually impaired players is the ability to explore the screen by making, object, by making objects selectable and highlightable. This is the main factor that distinguishes whether a game is accessible to those with vision loss. So, to summarize, players, uh, blind players and people, people with vision loss, in voiceover mode, they swipe the screen without detaching the finger and uh, when objects when every object on the screen is focusable it's by uh, by what developer uh, enables or this or uh, players can visually impaired players can see can uh, know what is on the screen and here this is the way they explore the screen. And this is, uh, determines if the game is playable for visually impaired pe people or not. Here is a short screen recording video where we enable voiceover, navigate to the baby adopter game, start playing, explore the screen with continuous swipe, and we will see how it looks like for visually impaired players. So here I will show a complete cycle, how visually impaired player starts with voiceover, navigates, explores the screen, navigates to the game and starts playing, and uh, explores, the, explores the screen within the game. Here go, he's goes, going to settings, accessibility, it's on iPhone. 
Voiceover on. Settings. Voiceover. Yeah. Switch button. On. Double and tap to toggle set. FaceTime. Double tap to open. Here the user went to settings, enabled voiceover. The voiceover starts narrating the screen to the user where it sees focusable elements. And here uh, the user starts to explore the screen by swiping finger left to right. And when there is a focusable element, the voiceover will narrate it to the user. News, app pop TV, WhatsApp, map new, make photo, apps, will pop, remote calendar, no, TV, pet wallet. So it's user fast swiping the finger. Settings, camera, settings, wallet, health. Double tap page two of two. Uh, to move between pages, you need three fingers with in voiceover mode. Two, weather. Game Google folder, X2 line folder, 11 apps. X, X2 line folder, 11 apps. Double tap to opening X2 line folder, X2 maybe a doctor. Double tap to open. Here the user opened the game and now again the user needs to explore the screen to scan the screen to see what objects are available. Baby, D99, cute white baby, strawberry carrot. Again, with user just moves the finger and uh, if if there is a focusable and selectable element, it will be narrated to the user. Baby, D9, last food, baby, D99, baby, D last carrot, strawberry yogurt, yummy fat carrot, yummy factor, straw tab, straw carrots, a tab bar, care, tab, egg mat more, egg mat, baby room, care, tab, two of five, selected, care, tab, two of five, pacifier plus five points, that give a hug plus one pop. Again, user just swipes the finger and uh, since the objects are made uh, focusable and uh, selectable, uh, they are narrated to this. Take photo plus five plus take photo pass potty watch that's it. Give a hug that's one potty pacifier plus five points. Give a hug plus five points. Tab bar baby bed mat baby room selected main tab one of baby D99 cute white baby D99. D99, 566 days old. Score, 395 points. Karma, live for home. Closing next. Moving objects and navigation is the most important me mechanics feature after being able to explore the screen. How do blind people move objects on the screen? Although iOS and Android support drag and drop actions in voiceover mode, visually impaired players often find these mechanics quite challenging. So it's very hard for blind players to move while, while with dragging objects on the screen. A simpler and more effective way to move objects is through tap functionality, or on PC it's click functionality. Players can tap the object and then they want to select and then tap again where they want to move it. So they do two taps. One tap on the object and second tap where they want to go and the object will move instead of dragging it through the screen. Here are a couple of screen recordings. Uh, on left side is uh, normal play, how we normally play, uh, I will show match 3 game and uh, solitaire game where we move the object by dragging. And on the right side I will, s I will show the same uh, gameplay but when visually impaired player plays it with voiceover enabled and how the visually impaired player can move objects. So here is a normal play like we used to. Open the screen, this is match three game. We just drag uh, eggs and uh, it's match three gameplay. And here is, here is a card game, solitaire. We also drag cards from slots, from between stacks. And here how we normally play. For example, we're dragging cards and so on. And move between stacks. And uh, 
on the right side, I will show how a visual impaired player plays without dragging. It just uh, taps the card, taps the destination, the card moves, we, and uh, we don't use dragging. And uh, bo these both mechanics are enabled also for normal people. So normal people can <coughs> drag and drop like usually, but they can also tap the card, tap destination, and the card will move to the destination. And uh, it's uh, already, f it's also a faster gameplay for normal users. Here on the right side, will I will show the solitaire gameplay, how it is played with a person with vision loss. Level seven. Level game number. So the user has to scan the screen to explore the screen first to see what's available, where uh, the objects, and so on. 38,168 moves, zero. Stopwatch, zero. 28, one heart, one, three diamond, 10 club, 11 diamond, 11... So here the user just explores the, the screen, explores the grid, explores the stack by moving finger, and since all cards are selectable, the voiceover narrates to the user what, what card is it, so the user first needs to just to scan the screen because he doesn't see what we see. He needs to like go with the finger over and uh, like many times over and continuously to see what what is there. Club, 12 heart, 11 spade, 8 spade, 9 heart, 8 club, 7 diamond, 6 spade, 7 club, 10 spade, 4 spade, 7 heart, 5 heart, 2 club, 2 diamond. 12 diamond, 1 club, 2 spade, 2 spade, 3 space 4, 3 space 4. Here the user tapped the card, and tapped the destination without dragging, and the card will go to the destination. 4 club, 4 club, 3 space 3, 3 space 3, 3 club, 3 club. Free space two, free space two. Zero spade, zero spade, zero heart, four heart, two heart. Here again we're scanning the stack. Four heart, zero heart, zero spade. Zero spade. Card space spade, card space spade. And going by tapping the card, tapping destination. Zero heart. Zero heart. Card space hard. Card space hard. Four spade. Seven hard. Five hard. Two club. Six spade. Ten club. Three diamond. Ten club. Three diamond. Three diamond. Four spade. Four spade. Three diamond. Screen recording in progress. Here is another screen recording of playing match three with, with voiceover. It also involves scanning the board with continuous swipe and moving X by tapping source and destination point instead of dragging. Weather. Games, Google fold, X2 line folder, X, X2 line folder, 11 apps. Opening X, baby adopter. Baby adopter, white smoke egg with blue dot, red egg with dark dot, egg with. Here we see a match three screen and uh, user also ha first has to scan the grid with swiping the finger continuously before he makes any light movement. green pink egg white smoke white smoke egg with green and yellow stripes egg with green and yellow stripe red egg with dark red egg with dark egg with green and yellow stripes C white smoke egg with blue dots C pink egg with light green egg with double pink egg with four colored stripes column four row five button pink egg with four white, white smoke egg with blue dot white three points three eggs. And here also, without dragging, player just taps the egg and taps where it, where she wants it to go, and uh, the egg goes there. Light green egg with dark green dots. Column light green egg with dark green dots. Red egg with red red egg with dark dots. Light green egg with dark green dots. 
Column light green egg with dark green dot. Red egg with the red red egg with dark light green egg with dark green light green egg with dark green dots. Column five red egg with dark red three points three eggs. Red egg with egg with green egg white smoke egg, egg with green egg with gr red egg pink egg pink egg. Here is just scanning the grid. With white smoke egg with blue pink egg red egg a pink egg with red egg egg with green and yellow struck red egg pink egg with four a white smoke red egg with egg with green red egg with a red egg a red egg egg with green red egg with dark dots column three red egg with dark egg with green and yellow egg three points three eggs six points three eggs. It also narrates how many points. Uh... Sure. Control center, airplane mode, switch button, off. Selected, screen. In addition to moving and navigation, like I said, with, 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 uh, with, in addition to drag and drop with adding click, click navigation, when tapping source and navigation, here are some more tips. For shooting and platform games, think about optionally changing the mechanics to direct players when to shoot or jump, similar to how pilots receive voice commands through a smart helmet. If your game relies on accelerometer, like moving the device to control on-screen objects, consider adapting these mechanics so they are not dependent on the, on the accelerometer. This makes the game more accessible to players with vision loss. Hidden object games pose distinct challenges for visually impaired players. Providing sound indications and auditory cues for hidden objects can be very helpful as visually impaired players might miss, might miss, might miss them without the ability to swipe directly, directly to them. They need to explore to find these objects. Using stereo sounds also can indicate where the object is to the right or to the left of the player or their character. Here is an illustration from Pulp Fiction. This This works if you design a hidden object game to be playable by blind, you can just uh, help uh, the player navigate to the hidden object. Tip number five is adaptive difficulty levels. Consider including adaptive difficulty levels that adjust automatically based on how the player interacts with the game. For players with visual, um, visual impairments, this could involve slowing down game speeds, extending reaction times, or simplifying puzzles, depending on their pe performance. This method ensures the game stays challenging but accessible. You can choose to adjust the difficulty levels automatically, which benefits all players, or alternatively, you can detect if the player is using voiceover mode and if so, modify the game by changing speeds, increasing timer durations and simplifying puzzles. Beyond these tips, it's important to involve visually impaired players in your testing process. Their feedback is crucial for identifying and removing barriers in your games. Start including visually impaired players early in the development stages. Their insights are key to spotting and addressing gaps in game design and usability. Uh, there's a known forum called AppleVis. The address is applevis.com. Uh, the members of this forum are blind people or people with significant visual loss and they discuss uh, games and application av available on Apple Store and uh, Google Play and uh, how to play them, what is missing and so on. Uh, you can participate, you can just uh, sign in and uh, um, introduce yourself as a game developer and uh, ask for feedback and ask uh, and this is a very open community and they like to help developers to make their game 
accessible to visual, visually impaired or blind. Adopting these suggestions means taking a comprehensive approach to game design, where accessibility is considered right from the start, not as an afterthought. For instance, developers could design a game with rich descriptive audio, adaptive challenges, and interfaces that can be customized. Consistently gathering feedback from the visually impaired community during development helps ensure your game doesn't just meet accessibility standards, but surpasses them. Accessible features like screen exploration with continuous swipes, navigation with taps instead of dragging, and making items selectable and highlightable not only benefit visually impaired players, but also make your game ready for other platforms like smart TVs or consoles, which rely on similar navigation principles. In conclusion, designing with accessibility in mind is about empathy, building a loyal and engaged audience and creating experiences that are beneficial for all. You have the opportunity to innovate and make gaming accessible to everyone. Thank you, and I uh, look forward to your thoughts or questions. All right, we have a microphone for questions. I'm going to bring it over to Anatoly's right. If anyone wants to line up and ask questions, do so. And I will actually ask the first couple, because this is something... James, could you uh, untangle me? Something I have to deal with on my games on a regular basis. Uh, untangle that earlier. I think we'd have to go this far. Uh, Levels on OBS. Can you check if I'm Are there any volume levels showing? Green, green, yep. green. All right, good deal. Uh, all right, Anatoly, so the first question I have for you I'm glad that Google and Apple have more tools for this than they used to have. They used to have nothing for implementing uh, any of these into, into games. What do you wish that Google and Apple offered in addition, like the APIs for the voice and uh, haptic control and so forth? Uh, I think uh, Apple has, uh, like, Apple, in my op opinion, uh, does the best job with voiceover. It just, uh, users can do nearly every everything, and uh, developers can make anything, uh, any game accessible, including, like, games you think, you may think at the, f at the first glance it's just, it's not playable by visually impaired people, but... Um, and uh, Google is just catching up, but uh, it's harder for d developer to make the game accessible in Google, for example, if we are talking about mobile uh, space. Uh, on Apple, is easier. Um, you just, if you have the game to make it um, playable by uh, visual impaired players, is easier. Google, many IPIs that uh, Google provides, especially for gaming, like when it's uh, drawing on the screen, it's much harder to make, uh, for example, uh, games like puzzle games, match three games, uh, solitaire games, much harder to make accessible, in my opinion. Like Google has uh, a space to improve there, I think. All right. Uh, the second question I had was, um, when if best practices around your data files for the voiceover uh, text. So for instance, when you were talking about the eggs, you were describing them four colored stripes, et cetera. Yes. But you're not saying like egg type one, egg type two, egg type three. You're giving them a description of how it would look. Do you find that that is a better, um, is a better way for players to remember it and interact with the game than something more what I would consider more easily memorable, but less descriptive, like egg type one, egg type two? Yeah, if I, like, 
if, for example, I did like act up one, act up two, um, it may be uh, like faster for them to play because it's like they know that there are, for example, seven types and they um, can distinguish them. But uh, this way, when I describe them, it's like make the experience rich because they imagine, they don't see it, but they imagine uh, the grid like it's more colorful and uh, like they imagine in their mind. It's, it's, they use the term, for example, on forums uh, like Apple V's where blind players uh, participate, they, uh, they use the term see, I see uh, this, I see that. Uh, they don't see it, but they, in their mind, they see it. Like when you add more, it's more description, uh, while it may be harder to mm, play, but they like scan very fast, like much faster than uh, I do. But uh, uh, like they see more, like their their picture is more rich. Right. And my last question was exactly what you're talking about on how quickly I, they move their fingers. I've seen friends of mine with visual impairments work their screens, and they're moving very quickly. Is there ever uh, issues with the um, with the the mobile interface, the touch interface, on actually keeping up with them, or does it? Or do you have to do anything special to ensure that it can uh, go at their speed? Yeah, generally, you, if you have uh, some descriptions, you you want to make them like short, but um, but they scan very quickly. They also can uh, uh, they choose the speed of the narration. They can make the narration to speak very quickly. For example, voiceover when you enable or disable voiceover and talkback on Android or voiceover on Apple on Mac, they can choose the speed. They can make it that. Uh, the voice talks very fast. All right, thank you. All right, next question. Just, just two quick ones. So um, you're free to play, but you're ad supported, correct? Yes. A little bit. Are you seeing, can you share anything of how you're doing on your soft income? Um, and that's part of the question. The second one is I was curious, out of the millions downloads, do you have a fan base that you talk to, in a sense, on a semi, not regular basis, I have a clutter page, for instance, and I have a couple thousand people there, you know, maybe I get 20 to 30 to 40 messages a week. Do you, how is your engagement, how is your engagement is one question, and are you making, I don't need exact numbers or anything, I was just curious, are you making any significant soft income from the ads, and how long your million players you know, stay around kind of a thing. Um, yeah, mm, I have uh, like um, on Apple, Android, I have three and something on my primary title. And also there are other titles that right. have one hundred th of thousands. They are, I also have a played, uh, paid game. Uh, which pl when players, uh, it's just uh, the same game, but it's just faster and has a little bit more features. So players who use uh, my free game, some of them, That's they, uh, yeah, they pay um, five ninety nine and uh, they download and play. Um, so but I'm it's without switch. ads, without. I'm going to switch the question a little. So you you have a, a full time job, correct? It's full time job. Is this the full-time job, or yes. do you have no. another job that's no. full-time? This is, this is my full-time job. When did you stop being full-time at your other job? Uh, when I started, uh, I stopped uh, my uh, previous job. As I worked as a developer for many years and uh, started developing. So my, my and, point uh, is, how long have you been self-sufficient at this? Because it sounds like you're at, you've reached that point, correct? Yes. Yeah, good. I reached uh, good. the... I reached it at the beginning, and uh, like a few years after I started, I had I had uh, like uh, very good income, much more than I earned as a developer back in companies. Good. Congratulations! It now it less, but still. Uh, I but can. you're still doing okay. And you're yeah. Surviving this way. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, so the second question was just, I guess, what percentage of your day do you communicate with your fan base? 
Yeah, I have some players uh, that are very loyal, especially uh, the most loyal uh, players are blind and visually impaired players. And uh, I have a community that uh, following. And uh, also I have players who play like for many years, for six, mm -hmm. seven years continuously. Because it's like a uh, baby carrying game is like an endless game. Sure, sure. And you also need to come back every day to take care of a child. It's uh, responsible. You need to be responsible. And s this is type of games that players come back. Um, I have, uh, like in terms of, uh, I look at retention, like D1 retention, how many players come back uh, I'm, on I'm the second day. I'm more interested in how many engage with you that take up some of your time. Yeah, I also have players that send me uh, um, emails and uh, also have a um, user voice uh, website there can they where they players um, open back tickets and uh, send their ideas sure, sure. they for ideas I have uh, also have like uh, like from I have uh, tens uh, of um, players per week mm -hmm. something like that Okay. who send me directly, yeah, it, who send me emails. It takes some of your time, right? Correct? Yes, because yeah. I need, uh, I need to respond. Like, what I do, I, um, I have a file where I um, add them. I also have user voice, where it's like automatically. But p people who send me direct emails, I, um, you I, uh, I note, I like write them down in uh, in Excel file and what they, uh, we're talking about and uh, many times it's very good ideas and uh, I implement them also the whole my, my whole game of baby adopter is based on user feedback what players send me I did because at the beginning it was like very basic it was just a baby and uh, you feed the, the baby but now it has many features and uh, every feature is was added uh, according to user feedback that people send me like ideas or feedback some ideas are hard to implement yes it takes time because i need to i, I always reply to emails and uh, some ideas like very hard to implement but uh, many times it's uh, very good ideas uh, in terms of uh, it's not uh, like time consuming to because it it's something that is not planned but it's, for example, it's trivial to implement and it um, benefits many users. Sure, sure. So I see how, what impact any idea or feedback has like on other people. So if it has big impact, I, I just write it down and uh, many times I implement it. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank thanks. you. Okay, next question. really not a very important <coughs> question. I'm just curious, it looked like on the eggshell game there was a option to like view a hint to move. How does that show up for the, for the disabled players, if I may? Yeah, uh, it's uh, for normal players, if for, for example, uh, the game detects that the uh, user thinks like more than a few seconds, it shows the hand that they can click on hint and hint will show them because sometimes you can't find a possible move right away. So it, it shows them one random move and uh, it works the same for uh, visually impaired people. If they tap the button, it will show them and narrate uh, like a swap, possible swap where they can go. It also, when, when it describes the eggs, it also um, mentions coordin coordinates, like row and column, where it, uh, and so where they click, they tap the hint button, it will show them and narrate uh, where is possible swap. It's a hint will show one swap, one possible swap. Thank you so much. All right, next question. So um, I noticed you mentioned that you didn't start out doing this full time. Um, do you have maybe any tips for uh, like 
jobs that might work better while you're still getting started before you can fully immerse yourself in game design full time. Uh, can you repeat? Um, do, do you have any like, tips or maybe recommendations for certain jobs that might help better allow you to get into game design full time once you can? Um. Do you program? Yes, I do. Yeah, get a job as a programmer yeah. working for a business. Or do you have any yeah, work, breaking in? I worked for I worked as a developer for startups for well, mostly for startups and uh, at one point I decided to try um, to do some applications and games and uh, at the beginning I had a good start and I think it w this what helped me for example, if I had uh, some, like, I, if, for example, one year I, I, and I haven't had, like, any success, I would have returned to my, uh, like, to find the like, job in programming, developing. I'm a programmer. So, if you are pro a programmer, you can uh, just... Um, in your spare time, if you have, uh, try to do some application or game if you have an idea and to, to see how it goes, to receive feedback. If it goes well, you can try to earn money from that and uh, if, you, uh, if it's successful, you will, you will see yourself that uh, you are ready to switch to be a solo developer or uh, start a company. Yeah, our last uh, session of the day today is how to make it as a programmer, how to break in as a game programmer. All right, last question? Last question. Yeah. Right, just to this. Perfect. Oh. Hello. Um, so I guess I have a comment and a question. So my comment is, as a visually impaired person, it's really nice to hear that someone's actually putting some effort into making games more accessible, since it's really hard to find a game you can actually play on a device that's uses something like TalkBack or something like that, so it's really good to hear. So I was actually putting some effort into it. Um, my sec, my question would be, um, do you primarily make games for mobile devices or do you also make games for computers like PC? Uh, my games are, right now, they are mostly mobile first. Like, uh, they are also available like on Mac on PC, but okay. uh, it's like you can, um, Categorize them as mobile first. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Anatoly, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to take a, uh, a five to ten minute break uh, as we set up for our next session. Uh, we do have an opening in our next uh, session, so I'm going to take some uh, surveys on what people would like to hear next. Uh, first of all, uh, would, who would be interested in a conversation on tabletop game design? would be interested in a discussion on esports and esport team uh, management and the like. Esports, all right. Um, uh, anyone else have any other topics they would like to hear discuss? Or the Georgia game industry? Okay. All right, so far tabletop seems to be leading. Anyone else have any other topics that they would like to hear about today? Yeah. OBGs. Like, oh, like 10 based OBGs specifically. Okay, I'm not sure who we have. It would be really good for that. We'll think about that one. All right, so uh, join us again in five to ten minutes, and we'll come up with our second session. So thank you all very much, and thank you again, Anatoly. Thank you.
All right, we've got a special treat today. We've got our uh, keynote speaker from last year back here. Uh, it's the live streamer, Tiger Lily. So I'll give it up to last year's keynote. And this is a uh, quick fill-in since our speaker dropped out for the last minute here. But uh, Tiger Lily uh, is a, probably Georgia's best live streamer and has been up to some great things. So let's first of all start with an update on all the things that have happened since we saw you last year. Yes. You <laughs> so last year I was here to talk about the importance of marketing with streamers for your, your games, right? What the importance of using Twitch or YouTube is for helping promote your games or bring awareness to it. Um, since then, I have started managing creators to do that with a company called Ants Online, who is one of America's leading online retailers of technology and gaming. Uh, we run a show on Twitch, and that's from Monday through Sunday now, 1 to 5, and I have a streamer for each day, including myself, which I cover Tuesdays. And so I've been doing that for a year, and... Um, creating content based on what the partners and manufacturers with Ants Online are. So Intel, AMD, Lenovo, HP, uh, just keep going. Like I could just name a bunch of partners and manufacturers that we work with daily. So that's what the whole last year has been is just doing that and keeping the show going. That's excellent. Our next conversation is going to be about building an esports team in Georgia. So let's talk about what it is like trying to build an influencer team primarily in Georgia. I mean, obviously you can grab from anywhere but you are recruiting in Georgia. What kind of skills are you looking for in a streamer to work with you? Uh, so for eSports specifically, if you like making content based on eSports, you want a creator that's playing the same game that the teams that you are working with are playing. So say you have a Rocket League team that is dedicated to practicing Rocket League every week, and then you want a creator to just like bring awareness to that team or maybe in, get involved with the community, then that's someone I would look for. Some of that is just phenomenal at connecting and engaging with that community in Rocket League and, you know, cheering with the fans, watching the games for this esports team. Uh, and that's almost the same. Like, the product in this situation is the game Rocket League and bringing awareness to the esports team. So I love that the number one thing you are looking for is how well they interact with the community. It's not how uh, lively they are on stream, how active they are on the stream. It's how well do they actually interact with the audience. Can you give us any examples of things you've seen people do well that stood out to you? Yeah, so there's there's always maybe a hold up in a situation where maybe the teams are switching and uh, you need a creator to fill that time in between the rounds, right? Like maybe the teams are about to switch teams or they're fixing the brackets on the admin side and there's just like a delay in time. Who's going to fill that? Who's going to, who, what streamer is going to show up in the spotlight and uh, make sure that the viewers are still entertained, still having a good time? And so we're always looking for creators that are engaging, making sure to pay attention to chat and maybe even jumping into games with them. So maybe they want to challenge chat being like, hey, 1v1 me, or I guess in Rocket League. <laughs> Let's go. I think there's only two v2 in Rocket League so you're gonna see situations like that um, where it's just who can be engaging and fun and entertaining um, in between matches or or maybe just share a moment with the chat just to like highlight something amazing that had happened that's great and one thing that you've been doing with your team is while you've been getting folks who are already streaming you've definitely been helping build up their followings so sort of it has been definitely a collaborative experience where they come in yeah. with some followers but you're improving um, uh, what they've already got going. Do all of your streamers also stream on their own? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I definitely empower my streamers to continue doing their own thing, right? Um, for example, maybe I have a streamer just for Monday, but she is a competitive esports player for Counter Strike. She still has to go to practice. Mm -hmm. She still has to hang out with her community. Um, if she is not being consistent with her community online, she's going to drop her viewership, maybe, and then that's going to you're going to see it on our end where that number or those like she's going to be hanging out by herself essentially. And that makes me really sad knowing that I have a streamer that's playing a game and has no one to hang out with. Um, and so like I, do, like I do encourage my streamers to continue streaming on their own, whatever I can do to build them up. So what's really happening is it's a partnership between streamers and the company. It's almost like business to business where we're trying our best to build them up, make them see, be seen, empowering them, encouraging them, um, making them feel worthy um, so that way you know, in return, we have an awesome show on that Monday. Excellent. And last question. So you've gone from being a successful streamer on your own to now running a successful stream team. 
What's next? Your own live streaming network? No. What, what's next for you? That would be awesome. Right now, it's just to continue growing, um, making like I'm building an engine, right? And I want the engine to be self-efficient and to continue working. So that way we could build on top of it. Uh, I have this amazing show and it's all live content, but what can I do with that? I'm now using that content to build a YouTube segment. So I've got an indie spotlight, which I actually started myself, um, but now I'm starting to do like first plays, which are basically first impressions of brand new titles, AAA titles that we have partnerships with. Uh, like Ubisoft um, just came out with Avatar. So that, that's what we're doing right now. Um, that came out in December, and we've been building content on that recently. Excellent. And where does everyone find you? Uh, right now, it's twitch.tv slash antonline. That's A-N-T. Big Cheese likes to make a song based on it. It's like mm, <laughs> A-N-T. <laughs> Ant Online. Anyways, that's, that was my friend <laughs> yesterday. Uh, but it's Ant Online, and then on YouTube as well. So uh, YouTube, Ant Online, and TikTok is where you can see my content and my team working every day to bring fun, engaging content. Great. Thank you very much. Everyone give it up, Tiger Lily. Thank you. All right, next up, we're going to have Kimberly Starks from Athena. So, uh, Kimberly, come on down. We appreciate that. Yep. The love. It's stuck in the hair. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me, too. All right, and while we're doing that, remember everyone, Georgia Game Developers Association are here at SimFest, Columbus Interactive Media Festival. We're also, I thought they were going to be here, we'll have a conversation with the, uh, mid, uh, the Columbus State University leads. I guess that will be you, not Michael and the others. Well, after, after Kimberly, we'll bring you up and have talk there. All right, Kimberly, Kimberly Starks, also a board member for the Georgia Game Developers Association. And definitely has the best shoes here today. <laughs> what? Thank you. Without a doubt. All right. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for joining us. First, tell the audience just a little bit about yourself. Yes. So thank you again for having me. I'm Kimberly Starks. I am the managing partner of the Athena Alliance CLT. We are an all-female stream team that has members across the nation. Uh, our presence is particularly uh, from Rock Hill, South Carolina, through New Jersey, and we have members in Illinois and Texas. Yeah, nice, nice reach, excellent, excellent. Now, uh, in putting together this, this is a, just a unique team, really, uh, yes. to have put in place. What were, what were the greatest challenges you had in setting it up? Well, the team was actually set up yeah. prior to my arrival. So I am the managing partner. We do have an executive director who founded the Athena Alliance in 2019, pre-pandemic. Uh, and the reason the stream team was set up was so that women gamers would have a safe place to play and to stream and to find other moderators to support them. And since then, our team has grown and we have a large presence at a number of the cons. Uh, as a matter of fact, PAX East uh, is where some of our ladies will be uh, in Massachusetts uh, later on in the month. Excellent. So what's been your, what have you felt has been your greatest success with the Athena Alliance? The greatest success thus far is visibility. So since becoming a part of the team, we've been able to have our presence on the East Coast, the West Coast at a number of cons. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are spreading the message that if there are women gamers out there to join us and to learn about how to stream like a goddess. Oh, that's, our, <laughs> that's our tagline. Like I gotta learn that. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, some great successes so far. It's great seeing you at the Game Hers Award. Yes. Uh, uh, any impressions from that on the, the growth of the industry in general? Oh, my goodness. The Game Hers Awards last week was so empowering. It was so heartwarming to get to know and see so many empowering women in the room. And it really does speak to the growth right. of the industry. And, and I'm just very excited for what's to come. All right, and what is next to come for Athena Alliance, other than PAX East? You know, making sure that we support other women gamers, that's very important. Making sure that we increase our visibility and positioning ourselves to invite younger audiences to learn and grow in the industry. Excellent. Where do people find you? 
we can be found at Athena Alliance CLT on Twitch and Athena CLT on Instagram and uh, X, as you know formerly, Twitter, and Athena Alliance CLT on Facebook. All right, Athena CLT and Athena Alliance CLT. Yes. Thank you, Kimberly. Much appreciated. Thank you. And we've got representatives from the uh, Columbus State University GGDA chapter. So a few, uh, yep, we'll pull chairs on around. Yep, yep, sorry about the cords. We'll bring you on here. This is, uh, we are also building chapters at other colleges. Um, this is our longest uh, lasting, uh, actually, why don't I just do the mic pass? Michael, would you put this up on the podium over there? Much gotcha. appreciated. And uh, James, are we getting folks in the camera shot, or where, how's it looking? We're about to check as soon as you said so. All right. We got him so far. All right. You got us? <clears throat> All right, excellent, excellent. All right, so here we are at Columbus State University for the Columbus Interactive Media Festival. It's run by, primarily, by our Columbus State University uh, student chapter. So let me get you both to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Caleb Farrell. I am currently the president of uh, the Georgia Game Developers Association at CSU. Uh, my name is Michael Grantham. I used to be the president. <laughs> at CSU. Uh, the GGDA chapter here, yeah, was the, the longest running. It was one of the Our first. longest running college one, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, with the, the pandemic and all that, like, uh, this chapter sort of went into hiatus about four years ago, three or four years ago. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago we decided uh, to bring it back. So yeah, so it's it's been uh, it's been interesting bringing it all back, and uh, the, to know that like the amount of uh, passion that people have here at CSU to make games, not just like programmers, because we have the the programming uh, tract here in the computer science department at CSU. Uh, that's where like it sort of primarily is housed, but we have artists, we have musicians. Um, we have uh, voice actors, uh, we, we've got a lot of folks that want to sort of be in game development that aren't actual programmers. So uh, uh, anyways, um, yeah, so my name is M Michael, I guess. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect, that was perfect. Uh, and so we, the GGDA mainly has chapters in areas, obviously, Atlanta, Athens, Augusta, uh, the middle Georgia chapter, uh, and they focus on professional development, professional connections, and so forth. But our student chapters do something different. They actually focus on the game making. Can you talk to us about how you do that? Yes. Uh, so here we have, we do have a games programming class, but it's uh, not available until basically your junior year for most people with all the prerequisites and stuff like that. So this year uh, we kind of have focused on trying to like, uh, our, our vision being to empower people to make games. Uh, without having to wait that long, or if you're not even a computer programmer, then we can give you an opportunity to do that because, like you said, it's a uh, it's not extracurricular thing, but interdisciplinary uh, field, and so uh, really, all it's all about uh, getting together as many people as we possibly can and uh, like seeing what we can do with it uh, and make sure that all of their talents are put to good work and uh, all that good stuff. Everything. Uh, yeah. So just to sort of piggy piggyback of what uh, Caleb was saying, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's here as a resource. Uh, it's sort of primarily started as a resource for games track uh, programming students to sort of fall back on uh, because you can program a game and make it work and and all that good stuff. But there's more than just like uh, gray world, you know, game mechanics uh, to to programming. Uh, I mean, to, to game development. Um, you've got, like, like I mentioned, like art mm -hmm. is a huge part of that, and game design, that's another part, sort of like having these uh, meetings every week, uh, being able to have sort of mini workshops talking about like different aspects of game design. So like things that you, you would never think of, like 
Um, I know that last year, like one of the first, well, one of the workshops I had brought up, like uh, how to use how doors work. Excellent. In games, yeah. Like there's like a million different ways you can do doors, <laughs> and, and it's, two million ways to do them wrong. It, yeah, and so just it's, trap yourself in them all day long. Like you, you don't think about these sort of things because like your gamer brain just sort of like turns that part off. But like someone had to like go in there and figure out how to make a door work. You know? <laughs> so it's stuff like that. Uh, so, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, when it comes to figuring out like how to put everyone's uh, best efforts to use and all of their skills, another thing is uh, you can't just like throw everyone in a pot and tell them to make a game. <laughs> I mean, you can, but it's, it's kind of hard to wrangle. Um, Michael here says it's it can be like herding cats with game developers. Uh, but yeah, this... Uh, our first semester, we kind of did like try and get everyone together, which which was fine because we had like a relatively small amount of people. Uh, but we tried to focus more on uh, individual projects and things like that, and inspiring people to do their own work and giving them the resources and assets that they need. Because uh, first of all, it kind of looks better on a resume, perhaps, if your name's the only one in the credits. Because if you're one of five people who did programming, it's you kind of have to explain all that what you did but instead a game can be entirely representative uh, of what you did. And we also have, uh, like, for, for artists, we have like a visual novel project. Uh, so they could all hop in there, and we have writers, sound designers, and it doesn't really need any that much programming. Uh, I can just take one person to throw everything together and run by. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Joe would love to hear about all the independent games you have going on. Uh, save that for when he entered the room. But uh, let's hear about some of the specific projects that turned out. What, uh, we'll start with Michael on this one. What did you see during your term that looked pretty cool? What did you enjoy? What, anything that particularly surprised you or stood out to you? Uh, and we'll go to Caleb on, to let us know more details on this year. So uh, I know that uh, with, with Caleb, he's sort of, uh, he's, he's taken over like uh, the transition. And we've been sort of, uh, like, when I was doing it, I did it for maybe about a little less than a year, something like that. I was, like, trying to figure out, like, the best way to come at um, students here uh, without, like, being like, uh, you've got all of this work that you have to do, and here's more work to do, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I tried to make it... Uh, sort of uh, palatable for people who have not a lot of time. Uh, and anyway, so, uh, so what we did was, um, when we first started back last semester, or I'm sorry, it was a year ago now, um, I was like, okay, so we have to have a scale, we have to scale and have a scope for a project that we're gonna do all semester. And um, we did that about halfway through the semester and then we didn't really actually get going until about five weeks before the end of the semester. So the project was done in about, about three or four weeks. Oh, excellent. So, uh, but it was, it was like a visual novel. We used Unity uh, to do it. We had artists come in there and do uh, characters, uh, like 2D characters. We had artists do backgrounds, uh, music, and uh, I helped out with like programming. We also had uh, my, uh, my vice president at the time, Eric, uh, Robichet, he uh, he did a lot of the programming. He's like a rock star when it comes to programming. He also did the games programming track here. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we worked on that. We got to show it off at um, the students. Every spring they have something called Sage, and it's like Siege. It's sort of <laughs> it's sort of like uh, a play on that. And um, but uh, but yeah, so they, they, uh, the 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 GGDA members were able to actually show off what they had worked on, Very cool. and people got to like play it and. It was also it was alongside the games two mm -hmm. uh, students. The games two because there's there's two uh, uh, classes here. We got games one and games two. Games one is for individual projects uh, for students. Uh, so you make one person makes a game, and then games two students they group together and they make a group game, and then they show it off in the spring, and they showed it off at, at this same thing that we were showing off and. It was it was great being able to like have a mini convention of just students showing off their work and uh, yeah so I forgot where I was going with this but <laughs> you did some good work last uh, it's, it was it was a lot of fun and and this year 
uh, I've I just took on a sort of a, a consultant role, really, Excellent. just to sort of help uh, Caleb out with any questions he might have. So, and uh, I'm going to continue to to do that as as long as I can. So, All right, cool. Uh, following up on that, uh, our our product our project for last semester was called the Collective. It was a yeah. visual novel, as you described, but it did actually require some programming since it's not all built in. So Michael here made like the entire engine for that. It was kind of nice. it's kind of cheesed, but oh no, it was all hard coded. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, it was just like uh, wouldn't have made Doctor Obando very. <laughs> wouldn't have made uh, the 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 best uh, programming practices were not really you know uh, taken into account, but it worked. Yeah. So that's all that matters. <laughs> they say uh, Undertale, like all of the dialogue for that was in a single switch statement I heard. Mm. So that, that was pretty crazy. That's uh, insane. But <laughs> this semester, and I think last semester as well, we've had uh, more individual or like small group projects. Okay. I took one upon myself. I think it was uh, Quest Till Death, name subject to change. Uh, and it was sort of like a Final Fantasy one kind of deal because uh, that's Hayden who had, had that idea, kind of introduced that to us. And... Uh, I kind of took that on, and we have Katie, who is our secretary here. She's doing the art for that, and we have like a bunch of uh, interested writers uh, coming on, and a lot of interested programmers as well who have not really like made a full game yet, but we're trying to take it like one mechanic at a time to uh, try and develop those skills without really stepping on the toes of the game design class here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's about that. All right, all right. Excellent. And last question. How do people find out about the club and how do they get involved? Uh, we can staple a QR code to the <laughs> camera lens, I think. <laughs> uh, but if you come down here to CSU, we have flyers all around the Georgia Game Developers Association. I'm sure you all will recognize the logo. Uh, we just have some things like stapled to poster boards, bulletin boards uh, all around the school. I think some of them got taken down, so we'll have to put a few more up. But I, there's I don't have my phone there. on me, but we do have an Instagram account. Okay. So, yes, I, I do have it. It is, it should be the GGDA at CSU, uh, I believe, and we have, we do have a QR code on that that you could scan to, oh, I deleted Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I do that hourly. Yeah, the GGDA at CSU, it should be something like that. Thank you. All right, thank you, the GGDA at CSU. All right, thank you very much for all your work on that. Thank you, Andrew. Very much. Thank you. All right. We have our keynote coming up, I believe, in about 15 minutes. Am I correct? Less than that. 10 minutes. All right. Oh, you have like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So go check out some of the games of the showcase, and uh, we will be back in 10 minutes. You won't want to miss it. <laughs> you will not want to miss it. Especially. So. See you all in 10 minutes. Oh, yes.
So, welcome to SimFest 24. Uh, before I go in and say some announcements and things about SimFest, uh, the main sponsor, the dean of the Turner College of Business, the whole Turner College of Business, uh, was, not be, was not able to be with us today, but she has provided a special presentation for you guys to watch. So, we'll go to that first. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dean Pitter, and on behalf of the faculty and staff of the Turner College of Business and Technology, we'd like to welcome you to this year's SimFest. We've been very happy to host this conference since 2016, with of course the exception of the 20 to 22 virtual event due to COVID. I also learned today is the eighth year anniversary of the founding of our student GGDA chapter, as well as eight years since Rod Ovando became the Middle South chapter president. Congratulations, Rod. Yay! <laughs> because of the impressive growth of the entertainment and creative economy nationally and right here in Georgia. Georgia's creative landscape encompassing computer gaming, film, and various forms of entertainment is flourishing. It is a hub of innovation and ingenuity, brimming with opportunities for collaboration and growth, and re represents a combined $29 billion in revenue with over 200,000 employees. Our gaming track in computer science is a great space to help our students prepare to join this industry. Being an effective computer game designer requires a diverse set of skills spanning both technical and creative domains, such as programming, storyboarding, prototyping, UX design, creativity, technical proficiency, collaboration skills, understanding game design principles, player psychology and engagement techniques, as well as adaptability, and many more. There's also a great potential in the area of the gamification of education. If any of you have sat through a boring online training program, or an online course that could really benefit from some UX design, you know that the skills needed to create computer games would be very useful for helping enhance the quality of various virtual learning programs. If you attended last year's conference, you heard that one of the reasons I wanted to be dean here at Turner College was because I was a geek and was very excited to have computer science and in particular computer gaming in our college. While I can't be there in person today, I am with you in spirit and will be thinking of you as I enjoy myself on one of the many game apps I have on my phone. So again, I welcome you to this gathering that celebrates the convergence of technology, creativity, and innovation. <coughs> All right, so welcome to Simpsons 2024. As she said, eight years since we started this whole thing. Um, I do want to recognize some people that are here. We do have last year's president, Michael Grantham, of the student chapter. You'll see him walking around, but Caleb Farrell is the current one. And then, and, oh, he's back there, that's Caleb. And then you'll see him walking around, but he's has his students, because now he's joined up the ranks of being a teacher. Anthony Obando. Um, he is one of the presidents from, I think, the third one of the student chapter. So we have the, a lot of legacy here. Um, I've been doing the Middle South for eight years. Sinfest, this is eight years of Sinfest. So it, this is a, a lot. We've been doing a lot. It's pretty cool. Um, and it's also good to have back in person for the second year. And it's good to have people like Bob Carter back with us um, and all these other cool people. So I just want to recognize sponsors. I know we did a big spiel on Turner College, but they are the reason we are back again for a second. <laughs> the, they made the lunch happen for you guys, which we had to change. So I hope you guys are cool with Papa John's pizza. <laughs> all right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know we're not grilling. I know that's like the hype of SimFest, right? <laughs> that we give you all uh, freshly cooked food. Uh, and then another one, another sponsor, is we got the National Guard with us this year. So, uh, they are, you know, go talk to them. They're actually very cool people. I've had a chance to talk to them myself. Check out their drones. Yeah, check out their drones, too. And then the cool thing about them is they are sponsoring the payouts, not the payouts, the prizes, 
for the tournaments that our other sponsors do in Polo Haven. So last year we kicked things off with Pokemon Trading Card, just a generic standard tournament. Oh no, this is a special weekend. It is pre-release weekend for Temporal Forces. So anyone that's competing today gets early access to cards that come out in two weeks officially. Yay. And winner gets another pre-release kit. We're adding this year, Point Base Magic Commander. Point Base Magic Commander is something the Holo Haven does, which the winner is the one with most overall points. And going on right now, and I'm very happy to say this because this game hits home with me, the first ever Pokemon Go Cup tournament going on downstairs, we have seven people. Yay. So that's exciting. Winning are great. <laughs> yeah. So it's exciting to see that. So check out Holo Haven. They have some merch down there you guys can purchase. Another sponsor, of course, is CSU. We are lucky to have one of the recruiters on site today. If you're a high schooler, today is, this month is free application month. So if you're interested in CSU, just put in an application. You don't got to pay. I mean, can't get better than that. So those are our sponsors for this event. Again, welcome to, uh, to the eighth SIMFest, if my math is correct. And. Every year, keynotes just get better and better. But here to introduce this year's keynote is Columbus's own Michael Stumphuffer. Thank you, Rod. Welcome to the keynote. And um, just want to say a few words about my friend Joe Casabaugh, who is your keynote speaker. Um, Joe and I go back to like 2015 when I was a indie developer who was hadn't done anything and he was on clutter three now I've got one game out and he is on clutter 100 <laughs> something like that 16 16, 16 excuse me excuse me um, Joe is a very accomplished guy in the indie world uh, as he will tell you and, um, <laughs> brutal he's, he is Probably the most successful indie developer in Georgia, I would imagine. Um, he, he, his, uh, his franchise, Clutter, which I'm sure he will, well, now it's a genre, apparently. Yes. Um, it is. Dominates all the casual portals, is available on Steam, is available on phones, um, pretty much anywhere you Switch, want to play. Switch, PlayStation now. PlayStation, Switch, not the Xbox? No, <laughs> not okay, the Xbox. I don't know why. I don't know play. why. I'll have to ask him. Um, and, and Joe has many, many accomplishments. Um, you know, he's, again, he's shipped so many games. And, I, and to me, the mark of success for an indie developer is, is how, quick, how much you ship. Um, and Joe, as I said, has managed to ship 13 games in the time it's taken me to ship one. <laughs> um, so that is, that is quite an accomplishment. And, um, and he's got so many... Uh, like long time followers of his games that that buy every game the day it comes out um, on his website. He's uh, he's a you know a near fixture here at Simfest, and I'm told this is his last presentation. Stop, uh, stop that! Uh, uh, and, and he's 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 the keynote speaker, so I think he wants to go out on top. <laughs> Sounds good. So this this should be quite a presentation, and I invite you all to uh, take it in and and learn something. So thanks, Joe. Thank you, Mike. Okay. We all set and sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm hoping this is a little different than my other talks. It's going to be a little less clutter centric. There will be some clutter in here, but um, we're just going to go with it. Um, as usual, I'm going to, I go at a very fast pace. I'm hoping I'm pretty sure there's going to be plenty of time at the end for questions. So that's what we're going to do. And I guess to explain, yes, um, Big Fish, uh, I'm actually a genre now. They make a distinction between the old style hidden object games, which were light adventure and hidden object. And they had a little bit of adventure co uh, um, component where, you know, you pick up a match to light this to find the secret door, etc to just pure, pure hidden object games, and mine is considered, they don't call it a clutter, clutter-like genre is what I think of it as, but uh, Big Fish actually, um, two games ago, Clutter 14 was the game of the year uh, in 2023 under the hidden object 
label that they gave it. So anyways, we're going to just move on from there. That was not planned part of the talk. The talk starts now. <laughs> okay, anybody know who this is? <laughs> Six million dollar man. That is the six million dollar, that's Lee Majors. Correct, he is the six million dollar man. That's how old I am. This is from, the, this is from before most of you were born. And they made him faster, better, we can improve it, so forth. Uh, and this is my 16th game. And that's the six million dollar game. And this is the pitch I made to GDC this year that they turned down. Um, they tell me constantly that my story doesn't apply to young indies because I'm in the casual, casual space that they don't care about. However, I tried to make this case that it does. They gave me the feedback that the young, that young indies would in fact like this story, but still said no. Um, this is what Clutter One looked like. You can see it's kind of crude. And this is what Clutter 16 looks like. Much slicker, I think. You can just tell it's night and day between the two. Um, so forth. But we'll get more into, actually we won't. That's another talk. We'll go for it. Yeah. So here's the obligatory money slide that everybody accuses me of. Because I believe you should share, but not enough. How can you make decisions without, uh, with incomplete information? And knowing how easy or how hard it is to get a hit on Steam or how much money it could make, depending on the genre. You know, there's no information out there and everybody guesses and it sucks. And then GDC, since I'm ticked at them at the moment, uh, they love to give you talks by people that their talk sums up to, um, I won the lottery, I got lucky, I'm the guy who created Wordle, oh, I created Threes, oh, 2048, and they all got lucky. They, got, they put out these things that are pretty simple that blew up and they got lucky. But I cared more about sustainability. So that six million, just to, I'm not a millionaire, that six million is really only two million to me. That six million is in sales. And that two million is over 14 years in 16 games. And when you do the math, that's 125,000 per game, which is pretty good. And it's 143,000 per year on average. And there we go. And the last three years, I've been very close to the 200,000, and there's no reason for the next two years won't be close to that, okay? So I'm pretty happy. It's, it's definitely better than if I worked for somebody else. Uh, but it's not, it's, you know, again, I'm not driving a Lamborghini or anything. Okay, what I'm more proud of <laughs> is this is a map of just the people that bought my, have bought my games directly from me. It's about maybe 1,300 of my customers um, and it's interesting that they are all over the map and so forth. And these are people that like my game so much that they found, they found my website. So they're biased, but it's still a nice, nice to see that it comes from all over the world. Uh, but that's not what this talk is about. Because this got rejected by GDC, so I'm not doing that talk. <laughs> okay. So, and before we get started, I want to do a little preface. So. That's the Buddha, and if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. This is a famous book from the 70s that basically says, don't listen to anybody who tells you they know what's best for you. It's, you know, develop critical thinking. If somebody tells you they know what's best for you, they're a cult leader, you know, shoot them. That's the, the, the point of this book. Um, what I do is I offer food for thought. I want you to critically think about everything I say and figure out how it applies to you. And the essence of intelligence is analogies, and I don't try to over-explain. So again, this is food for thought. That's me not over-explaining. Okay, so the next, next uh, version of this game, or sorry, of this talk, was, um, and through the years, Andrew has changed the names of my talks and so forth, that I, I started having fun with that in talks. But for a while, this was gonna be, hey, dad, I wanna create games for a living. And it was going to be me trying to explain how you should explain to your parents that as much as the industry sucks right now, you're making a smart choice. Um, and this is a glass of water which stands for optimism, pessimism, etc. Okay, and I believe in rational optimism. I believe it's the only sane choice. That everything else leads to despondency, despair, whatever. That, that even in the worst of times, you can look around and, and make a better choice. 
Okay, so then this developed into this. And for people who don't know, this is also a book, 1800, I don't know, Charles Dickens, one of the most famous authors, but I used him as a starting point. So steam reaches new records. Oh, awesome time for the game. It, it was the best of times. Star Wars, oh, canceled. 670 people lost their jobs. It was the worst of times. Uh, game, game business is still growing, bigger than movie, it's just huge. It was the spring of hope. Mass layoffs at Blizzard. Couldn't resist this pun. It was the winner of despair. Oh. Power World. Pokemon with guns. It was the age of wisdom. I don't know if that's a good move or not. And it was the age of foolishness. And that's Unity and their stupidity the last year or so. You know, just insane. And I use Unity. I love them. But man, was that stupid. Um, there's the Tale of Two Cities. And this is my one of my favorite books, and we'll get back to that one in a bit. But I wanted to start off with Tale of Two Cities, and my, my metaphor for this talk became storming the Bastille with Joe. And I had friends that said, you know, too close to, um, you know, uh, January 6th, but I'm like, no, no, they can tell the difference, and this is the French Revolution, and we're not going to get into politics at all. But the point of the talk was going to be how to survive and thrive in a chaotic industry. That was the next thing I sort of honed in on. <clears throat> this is one of the things I've used in my game, in my talks. Time is the critical thing. How do you spend your time? And in prior talks, I gave a bunch of talks. That's water and optimism going on. That's pessimism and optimism and how truth and lies and the stories we tell ourselves and a bunch of stuff. But it all led up to two points. One point that I want to hammer in from a prior talk is everything you do is in preparation for a future path that you can't predict. Okay? And the semi-original thing, that's so important, I did it twice, that I came up with this idea of what I call the lottery ticket of time. Instead of just doing Netflix and chill, do something, you know, read a book, learn a new skill, Think about your future and how, you, how to get it better. And, the, and I've had prior talks where, again, that's the key thing of the talk, is do things today to up your odds for a better future. Now, I got lucky. Clutter was both a lottery ticket of time when I worked on it, and it actually paid off. And the thing is, you don't know which skill or which improvement you do that's going to make you ready to walk through that door or take that opportunity in the future. You don't know which ticket's going to pay off. But the more tickets you have, the better off you are. Okay? But again, that's not what this talk is about. <laughs> so what is this talk about? It's a, the rational optimism part, and it's the heart of a solopreneur. And I want to tell you what it's like to be a solopreneur, and I'm going to try to convince you. Here we go. So rule number one is never bury the lead. And I learned something. Lead is spelled right. That's from newspapers. I always, I always thought it was the other lead, but it, it means getting to the point immediately. And I'm only, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes in, trying to get to the point. Um, but the point of this talk is, oh, actually, sorry. I don't want to bury the lead, so Joe, how do you survive and thrive? You become a solopreneur, or at least you start to think like one. Okay, that's my advice, and we're going to talk about that for the rest. It's so important I put it up twice, and yes, that's what this talk is about. <laughs> Finally. Okay. So, solopreneur, <laughs> number one I had to use for the lead, but this is really the number one. I call it number two, but the only bet worth making is betting on yourself. You, I can't stress this one enough when I thought to put this in. I, I, I bet on dog racing as a kid, as a, as a young adult, actually, in New Hampshire or whatever. And no matter what scheme I came up with, I thought I got better at it for a while, and I didn't. I will play poker against people, because that's sort of still you, but no, it's much better. I don't even spend time doing poker or anything like that anymore. I would rather do the lottery ticket of time, which is coming up, and have faith in it. I'd rather spend time doing something that's going to better myself right now and up my odds for a better future. And right now, you're in the golden age. 20 years ago, it was so much harder to get started. 
but you can learn anything from the internet if you're smart and use some critical thinking. You've got better connectedness. I used to have to, you know, give this to people and say, play my game. You know, you're connected. The tools are so much better. Unity, you cannot believe. Unity is like driving a Porsche and we were on skateboards. Okay? <coughs> it's that different. And what you want to do is you want to start differentiating yourself. You want, this is the, you want to smartly follow your passion. But you do want to stick what you're good at, which only you know, and you want to do it in a way that separates you out from the crowd. And that's why I like this guy. He, he was from one of my games where he actually, in my game, he's singing, I've got to be me, mm -hmm. which um, I, I always liked. Anyways, but you've got to be so good they can't ignore you, even though they will. So rule number four, really, and this is true of life, but game dev for sure. It's all risk versus reward. And what you need to do is mitigate the risk and make sure your reward is worth the risk. For Clutter One, all I had to do was know I could survive for a year and make a game that I thought would make either more than 100,000 or less than 10. Because I knew the market well enough that I knew it would get you know, 100,000 eyeballs. Can you say that again, Joe? Repeat all that again. So for the first Clutter, I quit my job. I knew it would take about a million year. And I knew at the end of it, because I knew the market well enough, that I would either make over 100,000 or less than 10,000. And it was worth a year of my time to do that experiment and see. And all it was was my time. I created a game that didn't cost me money. I didn't have to pay an artist. It's all photorealistic objects and so forth. Um, and by the way, that's not the job switch part. That's the C1. The job switch part is a small story I want to share with you. I had a friend who used to, this was his, his, his core philosophy. He, he would say, to me, I would not change a job for 5 to 10% raise. If I'm happy where I am, it's not worth it. I don't want the risk. But if it's life change, if it could be life change, I'm a startup, a third guy in a startup, maybe I get, you know, uh, startup money kind of, you know, dreams, then, I, then he might consider it. But for 5 or 10% incremental, no. And he's right. You want, you want to mitigate. So for me, the risk was only wasting one man year of my life which, you know, working for somebody at the time was about 100K. And by the way, Clutter One proved me wrong, came right in the middle, um, made about 50,000, a little more than that, and would have copped off at 60,000 if I didn't do anything else. But I figured I could do the sequel in half the time, so that was the next experiment that I ended up doing. So, but we're gonna move on. Because, really, you wanna keep asking yourself, is the experiment worth doing? That's, again, the risk reward. <sighs> Ask yourself, if you fail at this, what will you learn? Well, again, I thought, I thought I'd make 100,000 or less than 10, but boom, it proved me. I failed, in a sense, but it came in right in the middle. It came in just enough to, to justify doing Clutter 2. And by the way, Clutter 1 has now made a quarter of a million dollars for me, net to me. If I never did another game, it would have been 60,000. And um, yeah, so go on. So. <laughs> this is, so I was super smart in math. Computers, you know, for me were just, just amazing. But I was clueless in life. You guys are already ahead of, ahead of me. I had no notion of what I wanted to do. I thought, I went to an engineering school because I didn't like that my teachers didn't really understand my math questions. And I wanted to be a teacher. I can't believe I wanted to be a teacher, okay? <laughs> and I went to school for that. And luckily, I ended up, I took key punch for my first computer course, ACE, the only one in college, and it was three days to find out you missed a semicolon, and I didn't want to do it. I aced it, I tutored people, I saw really, really smart people like chemists and physics that could not grok a computer language to save their lives, but they were really, really smart. But for me, it was like, you turn on a light switch, the light comes on, it was that easy. So luckily, two years after I graduated, I helped somebody at a CRT for my first time ever. And instead of putting in a key punch and waiting three days to find you missed the semicolon, you typed it in and you hit run. Oh, semicolon, oh, boom, and it did. And my, it was a life-changing moment. My tongue fell out of my mouth and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I worked and worked and worked for other people. And 
the genius idea came second. The first idea, I wanted to do my own games. I got sick of, I was working for I when I was doing, I did Mahjong Quest for them, made them way too much money back during a boom. And I kept pitching games and, game, and they kept shooting them down. And it was really rough for me because I don't believe the game idea matters. It's the execution and all the things you learn while doing the game. So they half greenlit one and then they pulled the plug. And my, uh, when, that, when that happened, my wife said, can you do this on your own? And I said, not this one, but something close. I can do something. And then I had the one genius idea. And this was my genius idea. Can anybody guess what the genius idea is? Take the shot. No, it's not. That's nice. I didn't even think of that. No. This is a game. This is a basketball. This is one little corner of basketball that somebody somewhere thought it's worth a whole game. And that's what I did with Clutter. The mechanic already existed of just taking this hog pile of objects, they call it a hog pile, and matching two. Hidden object games were all, they were iSpy based. They were, you got names at the bottom. You're looking for a broom, you're looking for a ruler, you're looking for what? I wanted to go nonverbal, and I felt that one little piece was worth exploring. And that was my genius idea. And the rest is hard work. Um, I was going to quote uh, Thomas Edison, but he's kind of an a-hole. So, uh, uh, but this is, this is the inspiration perspiration uh, slide. And after 12 years, I've got recognized as my own. There's many, many offshoots of clutter, clutter-like games of people coming along. They don't, they don't quite get my sales numbers and stuff. But it's popular. And on the mobile phone, there's some very popular games that are definitely, if Clutter didn't exist, I can make a good argument that their game may or may not have ever existed. <clears throat> okay, so I had numbers for a while. I don't know if you noticed. I had Solopreneur, rule number one, number two. And then I got rid of Solopreneur, and then I got rid of Rule, actually, if you were paying attention. And now I'm just getting rid of all of it. <laughs> and because this is sort of the main point I want to make before I move on to other things. Even though I'm a solopreneur, I root for everybody else. Life is not a zero-sum game, no matter what some politicians will tell you. You don't have to win at somebody else's expense. Their winning doesn't necessarily have to affect you. Okay? There's plenty of room to all be successful. And I just, that I just felt like saying. And rules are meant to be broken, which is why I threw out the rules, and I'm just going to wing it from here on in. And I'm a carpenterpreneur at heart, because <laughs> I can do what I want. Okay, so I like to shove a lot of you know, stuff into these talks, and I try not to do it as much, so we're going to go through this quickly, but this is some more practical advice that I just wanted to throw out there. Marketing first. You've got to know where your eyeballs are coming before you write a line of code or draw a piece of art or whatever. If you don't know where you're going to sell that game, you're a hobbyist. And there's nothing wrong with being a hobbyist. But if, you're going to, if you want to make a living from your game someday, you've got to think of your market first. And I was lucky. I did Mahjong Quest for the casual download PC market. I knew 100,000 people were going to see my game. And if I got a decent enough conversion rate, I would do OK. What I didn't know at the time is promotion made a lot of it because it upped the downloads and other things. And it took me a few years to finally get the producer types and the marketing types to realize how much I was making them with my game, especially with the bump and the sales to the prior games and stuff in the franchise. I was really one of the first, you know, that really hit the franchise effect hard, I think, in my, in my space. There were people who were doing sequels, but not as much as, as sort of I was doing them. Okay. You can't, you can't feel guilty over self-promotion. This is also from my game. My stories in my game have become more meta over time, and I've actually told the story of my life in different ways of how I became the color guy. And this is actually, all these shots are from my high school yearbook, uh, except for this one, which was my father reluctantly letting me shave my head, or not shave it, but go from this mop to that to play basketball. And my reason, believe it or not, was that I looked tougher on defense, which, which I didn't look tougher on defense. So, but you really, if you're not for yourself, who will be for you? 
Now, if you're only for yourself, you know, you're an a-hole. And this last little part is the old, and if not now, when? Start today. Okay. Good enough is good enough. That's one of my mantras. Okay? What's that? What's that represent? Blocking the Suez Canal. What? Blocking the Suez Canal. No, come on. What's that represent? Take Two words. What? I was about to say take a lot of time. Ship it. <laughs> Get the game out the door. Stop polishing it. Don't do a Kickstarter for a game that's done. Finish the game first. Ship it. Learn. Get it out to customers. Get feedback. Make the next one better. Okay. Refactor yourself. Everything you do, you can probably find a better way to do it. Okay? When you get in the game business and you're going to try to put out 15, 16 games, you start looking at everything you do, and if you can save, you know, five minutes, you want to do it. Because you're not going to do that one thing once. You're going to do it, as soon as you realize you're going to do that thing a hundred times, that five minutes becomes, you know, four and a half hours. And that's, that's part of this... Um, Refactor yourself is that's a Japanese word that means constant self-improvement. Okay, just an iteration. And you can look at anything you do. And I'm not going to give you. I have three talks that talk about different things I've done for um, even at an engineering level or a personal level or whatever to to get better and waste less time. So the last thing is an overlooked one. It's one of my favorites. If you can. If you can impose your own constraints on you, and I'll give you an example. Um, I've written two chapters in a book, okay? Way back, had other things to do, but I wrote two. And I wrote them two because I was committed to this guy who had a website who, who put them up there. But the first thing I did, I knew I wanted to do a horror story, and I was trying to plot and try to do it, but the first thing I did, it's, it's called my mentor, myself and mentor, M-E-N-T-O-R. And I got the idea that every chapter was going to end in M-E-N-T. So uh, entertainment, uh, employment, whatever. And really, I looked up those words, and then I got 15, and I picked them. Man, that saved tons of time. I was at least, oh, I got some scaffolding. I got something to work for. And that's what I do with my games. I already have the scaffolding done. And occasionally, I get an idea, and I go, oh, let's. Oh, let's talk about a game about all the games I love in my life. And the first thing I did, I went, oh, I start with card, then some board games, then some video games, and, then, and I made the list, and now I've got 10 chapters, away I go. As opposed to just starting to write, right? Um, and this, again, you can think about how this might apply to your own life, but it's so, it's so freeing when you do this. Because, again, time is your big enemy. Time, when you're trying to get the 16 games or wherever, it's it, when you can save it. And these constraints matter. And even that good enough is good enough. One of my partners uh, used to say, a difference that's no difference is no difference at all. A lot of time developers polish something that the user's never going to notice and they don't care. And if you have 2,000 of these little choices, you can say no to 1,500 of them and you'll be fine. Or you can do the 1,500 and ship three months later. Okay, and that's, I don't recommend that. Um, what you want to do, whether you're working on your game or not, is you want to perfect your craft, okay? Again, with everything I'm talking about. And if you don't have a game ready and you don't have infinite money coming in, you haven't won the lottery, find somebody else to pay you to perfect your craft. This is the answer to the question somebody had from the last game, from the last uh, speaker. This is what you do. You find, you know, if you're, if you're an artist, you go work for somebody. If you're an IT guy, you know, you can get better at your job so that when you do take the plunge, you're quicker. Because, again, time matters. Okay, so does anybody figure this one out? This is look for really big, not look for your leads. Other people have guessed that. Look for really big opportunities. This guy's not just jumping from one little fish you know, to another. He's looking for that big opportunity that makes it worth it. And you want to always be looking, or you'll miss it. OK. So this is my Ikigai screen. But the reason I have it up here is once I realized I really had a digital 
IP that was also a franchise. It changed my life in a bunch of different ways because once you have a certain amount of money coming in that you don't know what it's going to be, that affects things. And you know, you're your own boss at this point, I don't have to work for somebody. But the reason I put it up here is to point out that the number one benefit of being a solopreneur, once you're reaching this point, is you can't be laid off. I can't be laid off. You can, I can only give up and go to work for someone else. Are we all set on that? Yeah. Okay. Just a That's fine. So one more thing. And actually, I'm going to go back because I get distracted. I can't be fired. And, you know, it really sucked when I tried to get a, we tried to buy a, a condo for a con, you know, rental opportunity. And the bank, you know, balked, regular banks balked at loaning me money because they were, they didn't believe I was making, you know, enough money consistently. They wanted me to have a boss. And I was like, what? They, then I'd be in constant fear of being fired. You know, uh, not a safer bet. And once you get a certain level, again, this is really good. But the nice thing is, even if you try early and give up and go back and work for somebody, that's fine. I did that actually early on. I had a failed experiment that in another talk I talked about. Okay, so one more thing. Here's the food for thought again. Stop. I always have one more goddamn thing to say. <laughs> okay, people that know me know that's true. And... Really, I have three videos, at least three videos from prior talks that have much more information than here, some quite a bit practical, and more of the clutter story. <coughs> I highly recommend them. Um, the ones beyond the three, there's maybe 15 more. I wouldn't recommend them to anybody, but the top three, you know, give them a shot. Okay, so, this is my no slide slide. This is, this is where I usually put the kitchen sink in and I want to make sure I set everything and sometimes I just list a bunch of things. But the important thing is, what's that mean again? Ship it. Right. Here's another nice thing about doing a franchise. And it's also a nice thing to know, I am going to do another talk sometime. <laughs> okay? Ship it. Because everything left over can go in the next game. And that's what I do. That's one of the reasons I'm fast. I might think of 10 things and only seven of them make it into this game. And as they get harder or trickier or something, boom, three get bumped. There's always be a next game. Glass of water again. Rational optimism, the heart of a solopreneur. It's all meaningless. Sucks to be in game dev right now. It's all opportunity. Best time ever to be in game dev. Well, that's partly the tale of two cities. The Moonshadow is one of my favorite books. It is the very first hand-painted graphic novel. It's gorgeous. It's about a kid whose father is a ball of light, a bunch of other ball of lights that are aliens that picks up his mother from the 60s who's like a love, a love a flower child. And that's his parents. And he goes through a bunch of adventures. And at the end, and there's two books within this book, One's called We're All Ants in a Meaningless Cosmos, and the other one is The Philosophy of Sri Hank Hanka that has all the answers. And it ends with this balancing act. He tells you he's trying to gonna tell you what he learned, but he can't do it, he does it in pictures. And what I took from it is life is this undecidable thing. It's about, you know, between two extremes. And you really, you really have to pick your own path through them. Going to one extreme or the other is probably not the answer, but you're going to fall off the, the beam at times. And in the book, he falls off, lands on his butt, and laughs. And that's what I took his advice is that's what you need to do. You better have a freaking sense of humor because you're going to fail as much as you succeed. Okay, so it's all meaningless. Sucks to be in game dev right now. Optimism plus solopreneur puts the fate in your hands instead of that uncertain world out there. And then you can decide whether you have to go back to the uncertain world or you just work harder in yours or whatever. And I'm going to leave you with a um, bastardization, I guess, of a Robert Frost poem that's mostly misinterpreted. You should look it up sometime called, uh, the, it's not the road not, uh, not traveled, it's actually the road less taken. But I'm going to end with this little couplet that I wrote. 
It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and being a solopreneur has made all the difference. And thank you. And I highly recommend the point of thought. Think about being a solopreneur yourself. And you can, you know, even if you're an artist, you can learn new tools. You can, if you're a narrator and you don't need a, you don't need a program, there's a thing called Twine. You can write a whole game if you're into story narration that's a, you know, pick your own adventure if you want to do that. Everything's out there. All right, questions. Uh, we got the mic set up over there. I'll uh, pass on the first one from chat. Uh, let's see. Make sure I can remember it well. Okay. And what time is it? How do you do? 15 minutes. Oh, lunch. good. Good. So, Timothy Johnson from chat. No, no. Comment. No, no, don't. I don't want to even hear it. <laughs> he says he's made more money off of bad code than perfect code. Very good. Thanks. Tell him I love that. <laughs> All right, Timothy love that. loves that, just so you know. Yeah. You can always blame Tim for, uh, yeah. blame Tim for that. All right, so uh, I'll ask the, uh, the official first question from here. What's next for Puzzles by Joe then? Well, um, so two games ago I stopped doing story because it was too slow. And I turned it into Clutter Puzzle Magazine. And I showed you Clutter Puzzle Magazine, volume 16, number 2. There was one before that, volume 15, number 1. And 14 was my last of the more standard games that had a meta story. Uh, basically, the last three were self-help like this, were so forth. Now, I still chat to my players because there's enough players that actually like that. They like thinking I'm playing the game next to them. And over time, the stories have just gotten weirder and, and played to that because I like you know, satisfying my, my players. I am, um, sometime this year, I will be, there will be a, probably call, it might be called Clutter Blitz, I like to change names, but it's going to be a phone version of Clutter that's not the full game. I have four, four of my Clutters have made it to the phone, but as is, they were just the PC version ported to varying degrees of, of success. And I have a company that will, will uh, help me get it to market, and I'm going to, 16 is wrapping right now. I immediately clone 16 into, two, into, into 17. And I will then take that and gut it and make a, another project that's going to be my mobile project. And it's going to play, instead of this way, it's going to play this way. And it's going to be geared totally to the hyper-casual market. It will not be photorealistic objects. It will be much faster than clutter is based. And we're going we're gonna to see if that's an experiment worth doing, basically. All right, if you have questions, you can put them here, any questions on getting into the industry, how he actually sells these games, where people buy them, and so forth. But I'll ask you one more question. Sure. Jeff. You make a big point of your games being casual, but by any real standards of how much time your players spend with their games, how much money they spend on their games, what part of their entertainment, life it is, your, your players are hardcore. They spend Co a lot of time, money, so see Correct. Players, and, so and what's my casual about your games? Anyone else go ahead and line up? The only thing that's casual is it's, it fits the you know, three ball match, uh, Mahjong, card game solitaire. It fix, you know, our target audience is women over 40 with some disposal income. It's not the Steam RPG first for FPS people. So that's why it's, the market is casual. The game, I have players that have played since quarter one and they um, have played, they play my game they play my game like I play free cell, which means they play it over an hour a day, every day, and they play one of the versions. And as soon as I, seven days ago, or whatever it was, I sent out my newsletter blast, which is like 2,000 2, people, nothing big. But I had 100 sales in one day at the $20 mark. And, and from my own side, I make $20. When it goes through one of the portals, I get like six bucks a game, so. Not good. <coughs> Um, so I see primarily your market is on your website, Puzzles by Joe. Um, no. No? No, the market, go to Big Fish, go to Game House, go to, um, uh, so Big Fish, Game House, I win, Game Fools, Wild Tangent, and like if you go to Game Fools or Game House, you'll see me on the front page. So I guess my question still stands. Okay. Like, um, how do you feel about Steam? 
as a way. I make nothing. I make virtually nothing on Steam because <laughs> the audience, the audience can't find me on Steam. I get a lot of backhanded compliments from the people who do play my games on Steam. They'll say weirdly addicting. Uh, they it blows their mind that I'm a developer that actually talks about myself in the game, um, and almost all positive reviews. But it's only a handful, and I only make maybe. <laughs> You know, if I make 2,000 a game over on Steam, that'd be a lot. So. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Michael. How's it going? Uh, so, um, I'm the uh, second half of a game, small game studio. We've got Alex Kingsley, okay. my, uh, the other half. Right. And just, uh, I guess I might sort of speak on our behalf. Like, I feel like you were talking directly to us. You can be a solopreneur with uh, two do, people. You can. Do you do a duo yeah. You, <laughs> what's tough is, I will say this, and then I'll let you get to your question. So, because I, I forgot to address, this is one of the few points I did forget to address. So, let's say you are a guy and you decide you need an artist and you need to do piecemeal work or you really like collaboration, okay? If you're going to do a collaboration, you better make the dividing lines right, and you better have, for all situations, who has the final say if push comes to shove. So like if you're, the, if, if you're a coder and he's an artist, then yeah, he can have final say on the art, but like when it comes time to ship, it can't be you both have to agree to ship. That's, that's, my first partner did that. I was in hell because he refused to ship for about six months, and he did only 20% of like little graphic routines for me. I was so, I wanted the game done and move on, so. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we, we do have the uh, like a unanimous sort of decision thing. So like we both, like the company comes to a, the studio comes to a screeching halt unless we, <laughs> unless we come to Our a decision. So we can't do anything uh, without, <laughs> without, you know, making sure that we you know, make peace and, and have that decision be unanimous. Uh, Good luck. So yeah, it, I mean we've got some uh -huh. we've got some interesting decisions coming up this year. Yep. So um, I guess uh, one of the things I mean I feel like I could talk your ear off about. I'll be around. Stuff. And I'll be around. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, one of the things that that I do want to bring up as far as like publishing goes because that's yeah. something that that we uh, wanted to know as far as like an indie game developer like. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to publishing. So, like, you got self-publishing, and then yeah. you can also make deals, publishing deals. Yeah. I picked my distributors because I didn't have to worry about that, and I'm so, I'm very little help there. Okay. I'm not a great marketer. I picked. I knew my games would go on Big Fish and I win for starters. Okay, and because they took anybody's game, and in fact, I was annoyed. Big Fish used to put out a game of a day, and sometimes a secondary game, and I was the secondary game. But at least still, people saw it. But I kicked butt of the, the primary game that day. But I had a game, that first game, that publisher, uh, producer and marketing types just looked at and went, oh, you know, ugly. <laughs> and it took me a while to finally get some respect from them. But I also knew at least that first game would get 100,000 eyeballs, and I had a 5% conversion rate, which was pretty good. Now, you know, I lasted long enough that I now do have a relationship with them, and. Now I do uh, collector's edition, which is twice the price that they asked me to do. I didn't even, I, when I asked them two years earlier, they said no, two years go by, they asked me to do it, okay? And that's part of the be so good they can't ignore you. <coughs> game House wouldn't take my first game. I, I was annoyed with them in an email, apologized later at a GDC and they finally took my second game and my third game, still refused my first game, and then they kind of switched over, and finally, after I think game five, they finally put the first one on, and now, if you go to Game House, this is the Clutter Series. That's on their front page always. You know, and this is somebody that wouldn't take my first, you know, couple games. Uh, Steam's a crapshoot. I don't know how do you do marketing. There's a guy, um, Mike, so Mike Brown. And Mike Brown. Oh, oh Michael Brown. Precarious. Yeah, that's, he's been here before, yeah, Vicarious. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I, I have a publisher guy who's, who's, who's had some successes in indie publishing some of his games on Steam, but even his latest, it's not doing as well. It, it's very hard for my type of games on Steam at all, so I don't care. And luckily, 
I'm sorry, I'm just saying, that's the one place I want to lie. I don't have to care about marketing, so I'm not the guy to go to for marketing questions. Yeah, I think that like that's that's one of the things was, um, as far as what we're seeing like going forward, we might have to uh, partner with a, a, a bigger publisher for funding or, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and you might get lucky. Uh, that mobile game I did is we're going to do a prototype, and I, I'm hoping the publisher will give me money to fund so I can pay the guy who's going to do that so I don't slow down doing Clutter 17 and 18. So it, it's always an open door once you're known. I don't know how you get, way back in the day, it was pretty easy, maybe you know, about how you get somebody from Sony or Xbox to talk to you and fund, you know, you usually have to show them something. And then, I guess, like, know, uh, it, uh, I'll, uh, sort of what, what I'm getting at uh, maybe is, like uh, like uh, artistic integrity, like as far as not trying to like change your concept uh, too much to meet a specific, you know. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I, um, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I, I constantly put stuff in my game that goes against others and artistic integrity. <laughs> Because I, if, I, if I ever get an idea, this is how bad I am, if I ever get an idea that I can hear my old boss or my old producer going, you can't do that, you know, uh, it's going in the game. <laughs> and it's because it doesn't matter because it's the, the good enough is good enough. You really, so I'm going to, two, two small things. There's one is um, I hate the producers, what I call the blue enough problem. You've got your game, it's perfect. The artistic director comes, oh, make that a little bluer, please. <laughs> and they feel like they saved your game. They are now going to go brag about how their, your game is so good because of their touches. And you just want to go, because it doesn't matter. Most decisions don't matter. And I'm not going to do the second one, which is kind of an off-color joke, and Joe, I'm just thanks, not going to. So, <laughs> so uh, real quick, I'll make three comments on yeah. that, and then we'll hand it off to our last question. First of all, you talked about decision making in a group at my company, Holistic Design Incorporated. We were originally several dudes, Holistic Gaming, so every project had a head dude who would make all the final decisions. The reason I bring this up is for student projects. I've seen it so important to have that one vision holder in the group who will make these final decisions. This fits the vision or it doesn't. Don't sit there trying to get a majority vote or one vote will take you this way, one right. vote will take you that way, and the next one will be a tie and you'll stop all together and we'll hate each other. Just have one decision maker, everyone gives input, make sure you trust that decision maker and let them, and just keep going forward. Don't stop to wrangle out what color blue you right. want to do. Right. Uh, on the marketing side, the name that uh, I threw out is Chris Zukowski. He was actually a SimFest keynote during our pandemic years. So look for his Steam presentations, um, the, the Game Dev Success Ladder, and how to, market, how to market a game on Steam. Great information. Check them out on our uh, on our YouTube channel. And uh, regarding publishers, I'm sorry that Michael Brown couldn't be here to, uh, today. He was supposed to be here at Camps Out the last moment. But we are, we did a publisher event at DreamHack last year, and we are tentatively working on a bigger publisher event for 2024 at DreamHack. So that'll be in October this year. So keep that in mind. And yes, you all are hearing it on the stream. We are looking to do Siege at DreamHack again this year, October 4th to 6th. And our final question. Joe, I love your energy and the optimism and the antidotes that you give are just so invaluable. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on pushing past rejection because in your last- Oh, never, Joe, yeah, never, ne never hear no. Never, uh, you know, um, so that's tough to say in a me too world, right? You, there's a fine line between being enthusiastic and, and stalking. And I, I will tell you one story. So I was at GDC. This is one of the GDC miracles. And as much as I hate GDC on some things, GDC walking by a booth one time made me $32,000, believe it or not. Just insane. That wouldn't have happened if I wasn't at GDC that year. And I'll tell you that story at lunch. But this one is I'm walking by with a friend I used to work with, and he sees somebody he knows that's sitting down having lunch, and he goes, oh, Joe, wait up a second. I need to say hi to this guy. So I start talking to the other guy. And um, he mentions that he used to work for Wild Tangent. And I said, oh, Wild Tangent. I said, um, I received a very funny email from them. Is, um, 
I was pushing them to take my games, and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't, and I kept writing them. I was like uh, the guy in Shawshank. And uh, I finally received a letter from, uh, from one of the guys, the VP, who said, uh, Joe, although we admire your tenacity, <laughs> you're this close to us never wanting to hear from you again. And I said, that's interesting. And the guy looks up and he goes, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells me a story the flip side. He goes, he goes, I wrote a letter afterwards saying, you know, backing up a little bit and just saying, hey, my games are good and stating the numbers again. So he calls his people in and he says, so tell me more about this Joe guy that's right, you know, so forth. He says, well, he says, yeah, he writes a letter, you know, so forth. And he says, well, are his games? And he goes, well, you know, they're okay. Well, but how was his numbers? Oh, his numbers are real good. <laughs> and they're like, and the BB, like, well, then why isn't he on the site? You know, but they were gatekeepers that were like, oh, my games aren't pretty enough for Wild Tangent. And the market has shifted. Ten years ago, that's what you had. You had gatekeepers going, oh, we can't let that crappy little game on our site. Uh, Steam, by the way, historically, I don't know if you know the story, Steam switched to their green light process or whatever because they realized they couldn't predict winners anymore. There was a game called Mick, um, it wasn't Mick Stuffin because that's the stupid dog, but it was, it was MacGyver, Mick Giver or whatever it was. It was something Giver. And it was a parody on MacGyver. I think it was Mick Giver is what it was instead of MacGyver. And it was a thing where these, car, these pixel, eight pixel animated things, you had to set off a bomb, you had to fix, uh, stop a bomb in 30 seconds. And while you're trying to do that, one of the animated things would come over and kick you in the, you know, at over and over again. And uh, two guys out of these 13 that are sitting around week after week are going, you gotta let this, we gotta put this game up on Steam, you know. And everybody else was going, no, this game sucks. No way, no way, no way. And after about six weeks, eight weeks, they finally gave in to these two guys. They put it up there, and it was like a number one, huge, huge game for them. And Steam went, boy, do we suck at curation. <laughs> And they said, we need to change this. We can't be curators anymore. And they were one of the first to make the shift. Now I notice it in a lot more you know, places that have made that shift. So um, I hired two girls to do, um, two young people that did um, the art for my only game that had a true cutscene story thing. And it was beautiful art, uh, stylistic but beautiful. The producers loved it, the marketing people loved it, and it didn't sell as well. My own customers felt it wasn't Jonas enough and so forth. And it led me to, we were already working on the second game, but because I paid them you know, 12 grand to make less money, I went, nope, we're done. And I cut them loose and we, I made the next game where I just upped the Jonas like to 10 degrees. And, and it did better. And I went, I'm done with, you know, I'm pleasing my customers. I'm done pleasing them. But I believe just doing that stupid failed experiment is possibly what got the marketing people to pay attention to my game, even though I then went back off the deep end to stuff they didn't like. They started looking at the numbers and, you know, it, it's, it's really weird. But that game still disappoints me because it was a great little game. And um, it's some of my players' favorites, but... Most of them just rejected it because it did not look like the other clutter games. So. All right. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thanks for having me.